Could you expand on this Minnesota nice concept a little yeah. bit? You wrote a whole post about it, and I think it's uh, it's helpful in understanding why they made this pick uh, as opposed to Shapiro, although it certainly doesn't explain the, the whole story. Um, before I have you explain what Minnesota nice is, though, I want to play a clip uh, from one of Wall's uh, recent speeches uh, where he's making a sort of slide joke about J.D. Vance and uh, ask, how nice is that? Uh, play that, John. Like all regular people I grew up with in the heartland, J.D. studied at Yale, <laughs> had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! That's not what middle America is. And I gotta tell you, I can't wait to debate the guy. That is, if, you, if he's willing to get off the couch and show up. So, <laughs> you see what I did there? Okay, so he's, uh, for anyone who has been asleep or is, you know, uh, out there Zach touching like, grass. How do I explain the couch fucking joke on a live yes, stream? Yeah. Yes, there's a <laughs> fake uh, story about J.D. Vance uh, in his, uh, the story is that in his memoir on some page, he <laughs> writes about having sex with the sofa. The person who made this up was very clear from the beginning that it's a fake story, but now it is a, a meme that's been circulating about J.D. Vance and now picked up by the Democrats' vice presidential candidate. It's also like a little bit believable because Hillbilly Elegy is a coming of age memoir and like teenage boys have done strange things before. Um, the diabolical part it was of it, just yeah. like totally fabric, like totally completely made up and yet it's taken on a life of its own, right? So is he actually Minnesota nice? I, I would not, <laughs> Minnesota nice is passive aggression right it's like yeah, okay so this fits can in i the stay rubric. over tonight can i can i want to drive up can i stay over oh of course oh sure make yourself at home right when you hate the person's guts that's <laughs> that's more like dad sitcom dad humor that is very memeified i guess and like i mean but this is kind of part of the asymmetry right like the mm -hmm. jd vance couch fucking joke is misinformation um and you know i'm not sure how many people take it that seriously but um but the fact is, like, Democrats can kind of sometimes get away with that because, like, the press is not as deathly serious about that as they are with things involving Trump. And, like, and so I think, like, um, I think Harris, I, I, I was going to say Harris and Vance, Harris and Walls are kind of much smarter about navigating the media environment. What can you get away with as a Democrat and what can't you, right? You can't get away with, like, saying that someone who's 81 years old should be president for another four years. You maybe can't get away with saying, wink, wink. It's a joke about J.D. Vance. And like Liz said, you know, there's something that resonates about it a little bit. I mean, J.D. Vance is, um, is I guess, kind of an unconventional VP pick. Maybe you'd say he's weird, I suppose. We've just spent the past few years operating in sort of like the trenches of crazy wokeness, like the excesses of wokeness, right? Yeah. Like I think all of us are sort of like probably Obama era, like, I don't know, man, a little bit more diversity sure is nice type thing. Yeah. Like some more representation in film sure is good. But then like a whole bunch of like crazy wokester progressives really took it and ran. And so how much will this applause line that Walls is now attempting to use this idea of like trying to draw this bright line between like, you know, we really understand the normal people, but like, those Republicans over there, they're really weird. Like, like, is this actually, this feels like the type of thing that would have worked 10 years ago and now it feels hollow or like a stretch, like, or, or I mean, are people's it, political memories just really, really short? I think they are really, and look, Democrats are pretty weird and progressives are pretty weird as conservatives are. I mean, look, I think yeah. usually the VPs don't matter. I do think, I do think the JD Vance thing is a little bit of a factor here, right? Um, because he's kind of unknown and can be branded in a certain way. Um, and again, it's a short campaign, so you don't necessarily have to reach the long run of this argument. And the press is not very sympathetic to Trump or to Vance. No, look, I, I agree. I think it's like inherently dangerous for anyone who's a political junkie 
to call anybody else weird because intrinsically it's a pretty fucking weird <laughs> hobby to like this into politics. Uh, yeah, none of us are normal people, right? Like anybody who's no. sitting in a governor's mansion literally anywhere is just like distinctly odd. No, but look, I, I think the attack is actually like a little bit novel. And one of the things that's remarkable to me about the Trump campaign is that they didn't seem to believe that Biden would drop out, right? That they thought that Democrats were a personality cult and they can be, you know, around Obama or Bill Clinton, they can be a personality cult or JFK going way back. Right. Um, but Biden was basically the candidate that was appointed by the party. I mean, Obama picked him as VP in 2008 because he thought Biden wouldn't succeed him. And then improbably um, Biden wanted to run himself and kind of, you had everyone come together and help him win the nomination in 2020. So he was a creature of the democratic party and the democratic party quite rationally concluded that a different candidate would have a better chance of winning and, and ushered him out. I mean, you know, if it had come down to a fight at the convention, I'm not sure what would have happened. Um, but they used every leverage that they could to, to, to make that choice. And they were not, um, they are more capable than Trump of like replacing a, a flawed candidate. So how, you know, one of the weird things about the Democratic Party at this moment to me is just the nature of how this all went down. I mean, you experienced the brunt of being somebody who was just noticing that Biden is old and doesn't seem like he's up for another four years of this. And then like hellfire came down um, and then suddenly it was okay to talk about it after this debate. And then Biden kind of gets sick and goes silent for several days and then yeah. releases this letter. Like that is all weird. Uh, like these circumstances are very weird. Um, there's critics say there's an undemocratic nature to all of this uh, because of the way there was no open primary. There was, you know, no open convention. Um, Kamala just kind of slotted in there. How big of a problem is that sort of weirdness and perceived undemocraticness for the party? I mean, I think there is a story about, you know, is Biden fit to be president right now? I mean, he seems to have some type of sim syndrome of something. Um, credible people have speculated it might be something adjacent to Parkinson's, if not Parkinson's itself. And like, if there is a 3 a.m. phone call from North Korea, or something, or or a conflict in Taiwan or Russia or whatever else, right? Then you know, is he operating at high enough capacity for enough of the twenty four seven news day? I mean, you know, it's kind of funny that the press kind of started stopped worrying about Biden the minute Harris replaced. They were treating it as like a, ho a horse race story and not a governance story. Um, mm -hmm. With that said, it doesn't seem like he's cling to her too much. It seems like a lot of the problem was that he was being stubborn. Like his actual approval ratings have gone up now that he's agreed not to run for a second term. And so, you know, look, um, Democrats have lots of problems, right? They have inflation, which is still a, you know, not so distant lingering memory for people. They've been too far to the left on some issues. Um, but, you know, may, age was the elephant in the room and maybe Biden standing down solves half their problems, not all their problems. And remember, like, like Trump is a flawed candidate too. He's lost the popular vote twice. He is also quite old. Um, he had the opportunity, I think, to kind of like seize the center after the assassination attempt. Um, instead, he picks J.D. Vance, actually overriding his initial instincts based on advice from his sons. Um, at the convention, he gives a very moving speech for the first half hour and then goes on another hour with like lots and lots of grievances, um, is getting into a fight with the Republican governor of Georgia, which is one of the most critical swing states. So Trump is, this is Trump's camp. This was Trump's campaign to lose. And now he's, he's not lost it yet. It's 50, 50, but he's no longer in an advantageous position based partly on mistakes that he's made. Yeah. But uh, I also, I have a slightly different question, which is really about the Democrats partially want to make this a, an election about saving democracy. Yeah. And it's perceived as some by some as a very undemocratic process that has led to Kamala Harris being the nominee on the ticket. Um, I was looking at this recent Harvard caps poll on that question and um, Demo this was from uh, July. Uh, this is, this is asking uh, if voters should there have been a more more competition to nominate a replacement to Biden 
or was it important to show unity and coalesce between behind Vice President Harris? Overall, 57% say there should have been more competition. When you look at the party affiliation, that's only 27% of Democrats. So 73% of Democrats say they're fine with Kamala being the nominee. Um, 85% of uh, the GOP uh, says it's undemocratic. That's a little bit of concern trolling. And then the independents uh, yeah. <laughs> are, that's the more concerning part. 60% say there should have been more competition. So I guess that's the question that I, I feel like is still sort of floating over the Democrats right now, just because of the strange nature of what has gone down. I mean, look, I thought what was undemocratic is like not having a real primary in the, in the first place, right? Where Biden yeah. refused to have debates, they ushered, I mean, look, the candidates who opposed him, like no offense to Marianne Williams or, or Dean Phillips, but um, they're not really a fully fledged alternative to Biden. I mean, Phillips might've been if he'd entered earlier, but he was like, kind of blackballed by the liberal media, right? He couldn't get on MSNBC, for example, because they didn't want a competitive primary. Biden didn't have any debates. They moved the schedule around to put stronger Biden states like South Carolina first. Um, so look, once you were in this emergency situation, I mean, look, I read a column in the New York Times saying, yeah, actually we should have like a quasi primary. I think the fact is though that Harris would have won that primary. I mean, she was clearly working behind the scenes to consolidate support from Democrats like 88% of Democrats now say that they're the nominee that she would, um, that they would choose. And so I, I, you know, she showed something in that interim period and played her cards pretty well. And yeah, I mean, I think Biden was stubborn and selfish. And that if you had had a Democratic primary a year ago, then Harris might have won anyway, right? But that would have been better for the process. But like, I don't think there was anything, you know, the fact that people, and by the way, Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips like withdrew after a few states, right? The fact that, you know, some voters in Minnesota or something didn't vote for Marianne Williamson instead of Joe Biden, I don't think gives him any particular legitimacy. And at least Harris was um, was his running mate. Right. She was actually elected along with Biden in 2020. So there's at least a little a little flair of legitimacy somehow, I think. It feels like Vance is a an ideological pick on Trump's part, but also a little bit um of, uh, it's sort of it's it's Trump leaning into the mean spiritedness um, that he does so well, uh, whereas Kamala picking walls is an ideological pick all the same. But it seems like she's kind of attempting to lean into this folksiness, this sort of like wine on likability type thing, um, the youthfulness. And I'm curious about how this contrast, this juxtaposition that is being drawn rather deliberately, like both of them are basically saying, you know, we're going to eschew any sort of pragmatism as to like picking a Josh Shapiro type swing state uh, VP. Um, we're not going to be focused on that. And instead we're going to go with these people where they're just like, we're battening down the ideological hatches and yet there's a very significant tonal difference that I wonder whether that'll make a, a massive difference uh, in the long run. I mean, I kind of halfway buy that, Liz, but halfway don't in the sense that as a congressman from kind of rural uh, Southwestern Minnesota, Walls was pretty moderate, right? And then obviously as a governor of Minnesota, he's been quite progressive, but it's more like he's, kind of amorphous and not fully formed. And I think they think they can mold that in different ways. Again, there's like better raw material to work with. Um, the, other, the other caveat that I think people make with walls is like there was a backlog of basically democratic energy to attempting to like push a whole sure. bunch of bills. And for a while he was working with, you know, split legislature and then Democrats got the majority. And so that sort of accounts for some of the massive flurry of legislative activity there. And again, I, you know, the backlog idea, the bottled up energy comes up in a different context too, which is in, in 2016, younger Democrats wanted Bernie Sanders to win, and he wasn't nominated, right? In 2020, same thing, Bernie or, or Warren or somebody or Buttigieg, and, and instead it was Biden, right? In 2024, not even a competitive primary. So all of a sudden now, you have pent up energy around a presidential candidate that you haven't had since 2012, right? And that can be overrated for sure. I mean, again, Harris is rising. That doesn't mean she'll continue to rise. It's a 50-50 election, more or less, but like... But it makes sense in retrospect that you have a lot of pent up potential energy that's now being released for Democrats. There's you had a, a blog post that talks about the long shadow, the long political, long, strange political shadow of 2020. Um, and that's a shadow that is certainly cast over. 
Um, it's certainly cast over my uh, way of looking at politics. Um, that is what I think about when I look at Kamala Harris and uh, Walls, because Walls, you know, you mentioned he's more moderate in the Congress. He's more progressive as a governor. Um, but he was governor of Minnesota during this COVID yeah. era. And, and during that era, he oversaw an out migration. I've got a, some slides here to show this highlighted down here is out migration from Minnesota during his uh, since 2019 when he took office. Um, there's some more figures from Minnesota state government showing domestic out migration. That's kind of how I judge like is. Are these people going to be responsible executives? So is like we've got Walls from Minnesota, Kamala Harris from California, which I fled. Uh, so, like, what's like? Am I an outlier here? Is the like how significant is that long, strange shadow of the COVID era? Look, I'm an elections guy, not a policy guy. Um, I don't have a good prediction for you of how a Harris Walls administration would govern necessarily. Um, you know, Walls said something yesterday about free speech, and he claimed that like misinformation and hate speech are not protected categories, which they are, according to almost all constitutional scholars. Um, I think they might be in practice like quite progressive. Um, but politically, though, somehow people don't seem to associate Harris with this difficult time that we had in 2020, right? People kind of misremember. They kind of, I think they kind of have a memory hole thing where they almost assume that like Biden was president in 2020 when it was Trump. Um, but just kind of breaking with that period. I mean, one thing I think people underrate is just how traumatic the pandemic was for, for nearly everybody, right? Um, you know, people dying, people getting sick, normal life disrupted if you're in a blue state or even a purple state for the most part. Um, just having more distance from that um, and turning the page, I think, is probably is probably smart. Incumbent parties all around the world have been in power. Um, we're losing elections in the UK and so forth. Modi won, but lost a lot of his majority in India, for example. Um, so just having a break from this really shitty period in American life. And yes, she was the vice president, but she wasn't the president. She is still a fresher face. Just having a break from like the super fucking annoying past, I think, is is a smart strategy. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. And please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.